Hello and welcome to Analyzing Finance with Nick. In this video, I'm going to break down Kraut's recent video, The Origins of the Greek Debt Crisis, and my thoughts on the Greek Debt Crisis, and where I think he made some good points, and with some parts he forgot to include that provide some context on why the Greek crisis mattered so much, and why it happened when it did. Um, I was working on institutional training desk during the peak of the Greek debt crisis, so hopefully my commentary can add a different perspective. Right, where I'm going to start off is the context of the Ottoman occupation was where Kraut's video started. And basically said they were kind of capricious leaders who sometimes cracked down aggressively on the Greeks because of ethnic rivalries and religious differences, while other times they were very tolerant and very lax about enforcing uh, the rule of law in the territory, and thus you had a lot of like unchecked crime and other types of issues what happens when you have a state that neglects some of its responsibilities. But at that point, really created was something called the emergence of a low trust society, which I'll share my thoughts on, but first let's hear the definition from Crowd himself. At other times, large parts of rural Greece were left to themselves, which resulted in the emergence of banditry and the general increasing distrust of the Ottoman institutions that did exist. Greeks started living by their own norms and customs, and what developed in Greece is what is called a low-trust society. A low-trust society in general terms is a society that does not trust the state that governs over it. The distrust of the state results in parallel social institutions being established to replace the state and where the people organize their lives despite the state rather than through it. Greeks stopped paying taxes to Ottoman tax collectors as a common custom, both as an act of defiance and as a means of organizing themselves as a society. It is to this day a common practice in Greece and also in southern Italy for small businesses to keep two business ledgers if you own a business, one that you show to the tax collector and one with the correct numbers that is only shared with the family. The refusal to pay taxes out of defiance and distrust of the state is a curious Greek custom that continued even after independence when those taxes were meant for an independent Greek state. Load. Okay, so let me share my thoughts on this. I think he is right that how low trust societies can be deleterious to social stability and economic growth. I always heard when I lived in Europe that tax evasion is a sport. And I think that it originally probably did start as a defiance to imperial overlords and a weaker imperial government that couldn't really enforce it. But then it just kind of became later institutional because it doesn't explain why southern Italy and Spain and France and Portugal and many other parts of Europe have a similar culture of tax evasion. The other problem is it's simply just tax rates in most of Europe are significantly higher than they are in the United States and the degree of service of the welfare state particularly if you are under retirement age um, is not consistent and even if it is consistent it's just a lot of the taxes are just simply too high for many of these economies or businesses to bear and so what cannot be paid will not be paid. But it's not just also a Southern European phenomenon of lower trust societies. Lower trust societies are common throughout the world. Um, it's definitely the case in many East Asian countries, such as um, the ASEAN region and China, what I would consider pretty low trust societies. Latin America um, is also a low trust society in many parts of Africa. Uh, the reason really for this is similar to in the situation of Greece is that the governments in many of these parts of the world are corrupt and they do not really have the development of a strong private civil institutions as a means of mediation or the strong legal precedents that many countries under a common law system have. And low trust society is mainly bad for economic growth is because in order to really make businesses and projects at large scales you need 
to have management and or business partners that are outside your family or raise capital from people who are not related to you. If you have to rely on your family to finance your business and to to employ your to be like the primary source of employment and management of your business, unless if you have a super big family, it's very hard to grow um, that way. Like the reason why English-speaking countries have success, such a strong success of economic growth is because of the strength of the financial institutions and the rule of law allows businesses to trust non-family members enough that they will lend money to each other or participate in the capital markets or do business or knowing that people will, be, will honor their contracts or if they don't honor their contracts there'll be a court system that rectifies the dispute in a fair fashion. Now let's keep going. This throughout many parts of Europe, created through religious abuse of power, fascism, organized crime, communism, or as an imperial legacy. That many of them are found in the Mediterranean and are either Catholic or Orthodox is entirely incidental. It is neither geography nor culture that shaped these social frameworks, but the decay of its institutions through specific historic events and developments. The relationship these... Yeah, he's correct on that. It's really just the economic institutions in a corrupt government make people not trust the state, not have people not trust other people, not because they're inherently bad people, it's because that they can't trust other people because if something goes wrong, they can't trust the legal system to fairly judge them. And that is why these low trust societies have developed. And again, he's missing a lot of other parts of the world that have this problem. It's not just a Southern European issue. These European societies have with their state is more comparable to the relationship Colombian, Nigerian and Burmese societies have with their state rather than with German society whose relationship with the state has more in common with Japan and South Korea than Greece. Low trust societies however do not only distrust the state. To a degree every society distrusts the state. What makes a low trust society unique is that the people tend to distrust each other. With the absence of the authority within a state as an arbiter and enforcer of law and order, low trust societies rely on their own norms to keep order. And these norms and customs are often built upon family groups and small kinship structures competing with each other. Norms can be bent or even breached. The only extent to which you can trust people outside of your immediate kin group is measured by how much they are indebted to you. Add in bandits or organized crime and you end up with a society in which nobody trusts anyone except their immediate immediate family circles. Interestingly, a way that... Yeah, I mean, that kind of is the key here, a low trust society is not just a distrust of government because there are plenty of countries such as the United States of America where generally most people distrust the government, but they trust other people enough because the institutions will give a recourse if somebody is going to act in, in a not so honorable way. Uh, and then you do see, um, and that's what also makes the United States really particularly a unique country, I think, is because it is one that generally distrusts the state and uses the citizens' liberty to put pressure on the government to not abuse power, but at the same time has enough trust within the individual community, and particularly within the business community, to have a prosperous economy. I think in a certain countries such as Germany and Japan, where they have relatively high trust in themselves and high trust in the government, it's stifling oftentimes to innovation and civil liberties. And then you have on the other side, like countries like Greece, where they neither trust the institutions of themselves nor the government. And I think part of the reason why the US was able to develop that as well as they has is because the United States has a lot of history of non-government uh, institutions and um, civil society avenues that are outside of the state that allow people to express their grievances. Uh, well, th what those are specifically is a whole other topic, but I think that the uniqueness of the United States developing a whole set of private civil society to help people get along and also just develop a sense of community outside of
patriotism and ties to the state is, I think, part of what makes the United States a very unique and dynamic economy. This can be observed is through architecture. Throughout rural Greece, you will find an architecture style of home building that is inward-centered and socially defensive. Inner courtyards and walls that are meant to hide any potential wealth and business from the praying eyes of neighbors, while deliberately keeping the outside facade as modest as possible. You will find... Yeah, this is fascinating. I noticed this when I traveled in southern France and in Latin America. You would see like this very plain wall outside or a very like nondescript like city block type facade but if you go behind the gate it's a very elaborate and nice complex whether it's a house or a hotel or a variety of other things and I used to wonder why I mean maybe that this was the case I think it partially had to do with um, safety you didn't want criminals to target like the property to know they have assets but I also think I guess like there's an element of tax evasion and uh, defense of social defensiveness that comes in and Kraut explains that very well. In home architecture like this in many low trust societies in southern Italy, in Greece, in Nigeria or in Colombia. The result of this social structure in which nobody trusts their neighbor and everyone sees everyone as a competitor or potential rival is the development of a deeply entrenched clientelism in political matters and business. Business and political decision making is increasingly conducted on a favor based system. You get someone's support or loyalty only in exchange for informal handshake or through under the table backroom deal agreements. The Greek nation-state that was born in the early 1800s had a weak state, a society that distrusted the state, and a society in which nobody trusted anyone unless they were related or owed them something. One of the major causes of many of Greece's problems is not that you can't trust Greeks, it's that Greeks don't trust the Greek state, and that Greeks don't trust Greeks. Greek independence is regarded by many historians to have been the first humanitarian intervention. The Greeks themselves would have never won independence without Russian, French or British support, who then placed the... That is true, and even after Greece became independent, they relied on particularly British financial support and loans from the UK and France to stay financially solvent. And Greece did default in the 19th century in the early 20th century due to debt issues. However, back then, they didn't. their default rates weren't any higher than, say, Italy's or Portugal or Spain's. And the, the thing is, is that why was it different in 2008 through 2015, which was the peak of the Greek debt crisis? That is the question we're gonna to try to answer as we keep going in this series. The next component of this is industrialization or lack thereof. In Northern and Western Europe and in the United States, uh, industrialization took place as factories were developed and the demand for labor was to the point where it was more profitable for subsistence level and working class farmers to work in the factories for a wage instead of farming. And this was able to create more advanced goods in their economy and their, at a cheaper price and industrialization resulted in rapid economic growth and a more industrial organization of society and politics. Uh, whereas Krauss is going to mention is that this same process did not necessarily occur in Greece. Greece and large parts of the Balkans. Instead, urbanization occurred through the transfer of village populations into urban regions without industrial or political development, but as centers of public administration and commerce. Industry sectors did not really emerge until the 1930s. This resulted in rural customs and norms, as well as rural communities being preserved within a city. According to the Greek sociologist Apostolos Papakostas, what happened is that Greek cities transformed into becoming cities of peasants and that the city Greek became a sort of urban peasant. You can observe a similar process in American cities where Italian and Greek immigrant communities formed such communities of urban villages until they recently started to dissolve and integrate into the wider American society. Greece, however, did at the time not have the strong enough state to dissolve the structures of these urban villages. Urbanization and modernization did not come with political development. Okay, so this urban peasant thing is, I think, a big component here. 
And he does make a good point in the United States when it comes to this. However, I would argue that a lot of the machine-style politics in urban America today, particularly in cities such as Chicago, is a product of this urban village type culture. Meant for Greek democracy when it arrived in 1864 was that its voting blocks were not organized around social classes, but region and clan based. Political power in the new Greek democracy was therefore administered on a quid pro quo basis of clientelism, just as political power had before democracy. My question is how is this different than what goes on in New York during the Tammany Hall era, or arguably Chicago for most of the 20th century in the United States. Uh, I don't think this is a uniquely Greek feature, really, is my point. There's always been politics based on clan and family or ethnic affiliation, in the case more so in the United States, whereas in Greece, since they're all Greek, it's more on familial loyalties and who you know. and even in America, a lot of politics, is particularly on the primary level, is based on, um, on the personal relationships and who knows who and who owes people a favor. So I don't necessarily think this is a uniquely Greek thing like Kraut does, or a especially common in Greece. So the next several minutes of the video, he breaks down how Greece struggled horribly with a German occupation in World War II with as many as two out of three Greeks being directly involved in the resistance of occupation of the country during the Second World War. And because of how tense the political system was in Greece at the time, the Greeks then had their own civil war that started during World War II and extended um, into the late 1940s and eventually they had a fascist takeover in Greece uh, and it resulted in some atrocities and he talks about the general atrocities of fascism which is really not what my channel really goes into as more so we're going to start to go and cut back to his segment on the economic impacts and about an underrated aspect of these types of regimes is in fact um, how um, institutional corruption is baked in due to lacks of checks and balances that are in the system. One of the most devastating legacies for any society that is recovering from it, institutional corruption. Fascist regimes tend to be some of the most crooked and corrupt. Fascist states from Chile to Argentina to Spain and everywhere else are almost universally steeped in extreme corruption and embezzlement. Through the abolition of systems of public accountability, no institutions remain to check the abuses of power that fascist rulers engage in. Consequently, they get away with misappropriating enormous funds and establishing clientistic economic structures. The process of competition among the private sector within a market economy is thereby replaced by a process of scheming for the favor of state officials by the private sector. A bribe here and a bribe there to gain favors and give favors. In lap yeah, I mean, that is a point that I've never really thought of. I'd like to see the data about how um, authoritarian fascist regimes, corruption levels, and the economic loss due to graft compares to democratic societies and other um, authoritarian left-wing societies. And I would, because I think it's, a lot of the authoritarian societies, I think it's probably very similar because in democratic societies with good institutions, which is the key if and caveat here, have non-governmental public watchdog associations to keep check on these things. They have free press. They have built in within the government a system of checks and balances such as within the United States you have the legislature, the executive branch, and the Supreme Court, which can be controlled by three by different parties in theory at the same time, but usually it's one of the two big ones in the United States. But that degree of checks and balances is usually eliminated in an authoritarian regime as part of the need to consolidate for power and eliminate potential competition. But with the so-called potential and higher efficiency from an authoritarian government, you get the drawback of increased corruption and graft. 
So let's see how that this developed in Greece specifically. Um, there is a combination really of Greece of institutional corruption on both the right and the left, which kind of brought the worst cases of both the public finance. Um, on the right, it seems like they helped develop the culture of tax non-compliance. And on the left, you had the expectation of graft that during the right-wing regime was only supposedly fee for the friends of the regime to a more populist appeal that everybody should be a net taker of the government. But let's see what Kraut has to say about that. Engaged in quid pro quo deals with the rulers and the dishing out of favors in exchange for deregulation and tax exemption. The result was that the by now common custom of refusing to pay taxes was strengthened, not just among smaller business owners, but made part and parcel of large business culture in Greece. The enormous shipbuilding and commercial shipping industries of Greece remained largely untaxed from the 1950s right up to the financial crash. That amazes me because Greek shipping is huge. Like there are several major Greek shipping firms that are big enough to be listed on U.S. exchanges on the stock market. So, I think they went so long without paying taxes, if true. This shows you just how endemic the sport of tax evasion was in Greece pre-crisis. ...of 2008. But you cannot wag your finger at and blame the very wealthy alone. Take a look at satellite images of Athens and you will find one of the reasons why. You will notice an enormous amount of privately owned swimming pools in a lot of small private homes. Water is a valuable resource in Greece that cannot be wasted. Therefore, if you own a private swimming pool in Athens, you are supposed to register its existence with the city council to pay a special water tax. Now, with this image of hundreds of private pools you are seeing in mind, you should know that until 2008, there officially were only three private swimming pools registered in Athens. Yeah, this is again the most endemic about the Greeks' view on tax compliance and yeah, that's amazing that people were just that confident to not even register their pool tax. I mean, I guess like that'd be the equivalent in America of just nobody paying their car registration. Um, it's, it's fascinating to me, but yeah, that kind of shows you it wasn't just a thing of the upper classes, it just was a... It was just a cult endemic to the culture at this point. People simply didn't register them to avoid paying the tax. Now you can't blame it all on swimming pools alone, but this stands in general for how this custom of refusing to pay any tax was very widespread. I think the pool stat is probably the most fascinating thing in this entire video um, in terms of just single facts that I've learned. On a larger scale, smaller businesses often didn't register any of their conducted business for taxation purposes. By some estimates, the Greek shadow economy made up between 30 to 40 percent of the Greek economy. Yes, that means that a third to almost half of a national economy was completely untaxed. Add to that that the large private sector industries had negotiated enormous tax exemptions and you have a recipe for disaster. However, the worst contributing factor is that this system of clientelism between the state and the private sector was continued after the return of democracy in 1974 by the emerging conservative political party, New Democracy. Conservative Greek political power was built on a preservation and continuation of a status quo that was beneficial for private business interests, but fiscally extremely irresponsible. Yeah, when the left finally took power in Greece, the situation of institutional corruption really didn't change. All they really did is democratize it and revolve it around the public sector. See, was the Pan-Hellenic Socialist Movement, or PASOK. Rather than changing the status quo, its first 10 years in government were spent building another clientistic system, however revolving around the public sector. PASOK had a chance to reform the Greek state and get rid of the corruption that had festered deep into the state apparatus, but instead the Greek socialists sort of seized the means of corruption. Rather than dismantling the corrupt structures, they made them available to everyone. The main target of this were the national bank and the teaching sector, where appointments were increasingly no longer made on the basis of merit, but on the basis of clientelism. 
vital national institutions, such as the National Bank, which are essential for the functioning of any modern state, were undermined and used increasingly as political instruments. This sounds like if Tammany Hall ran an entire country. That's what this seems to be the analogy of it. And it's that the business owners get a break from the government, the left and the individuals get jobs that they are underqualified for. Sometimes, as you'll mention later, ghost jobs that never even existed, and pensions from the government, and everybody gets something from the government. And it's all paid for through borrowing, a.k.a. other people's money, which is eventually future taxes, but we'll get to that. Instruments of power. When the Conservatives were re-elected, they did not try to abolish the system of political appointments, but instead kept the system and merely tried to outnumber the appointees loyal to the previous government with additional appointees loyal to themselves. The effect this had was not only that less qualified people ended up in state positions that require very high qualifications, but that these state institutions were increasingly ineffective in challenging power abuses and providing checks and balances. Yeah, that's why like I saw stories in like Portugal and Spain and Greece where the valedictorians of some of the top high schools in those countries, they don't really want to work on Wall Street or be doctors or work at big tech. No, the career ambitions of many of them are government bureaucrats. And as an American, that always baffled me. But when I did more research on the economic structures of those countries and how dependent really wealth is on patronage and connection to the state or old money, it makes more sense. You might as well get the guarantees and the laid back lifestyle if you're just going to end up middle class more likely than not at best anyway. Balances or, well, to even just do for what they were created in the first place, their job. PASOK and ND traded power in elections five times and all these changes in power began with political appointments in the institutions of the state and public sector. Up to 40% of public sector employees ended up having received their jobs through political appointments. The powerful public sector labor unions also guaranteed tenure for most such appointment jobs, meaning that rather than replacing them with a change in power, new governments just hired more to outnumber the previously appointed ones. This, as you can probably imagine, resulted in utter lunacy. An enduring mystery to this very day is just how many employees the Greek National Bank had before 2008. The number must be astronomical and completely nonsensical. This system established by the Greek socialists trickled down even into the lowest segments of the public sector. The city of Athens, for example, has 13 hospitals. Up until 2008, each one of these on average employed 30 gardeners to manage a public garden. But only one of these 13 hospitals actually has a public garden. The remaining 12 hospitals basically provided ghost jobs through public sector appointment. What's worse about this is that before the return of democracy, Greece had a very sufficient and strong community structure. Working people usually didn't have the benefits of corrupted states available to them. Because of this, the Greek working population became very self-reliant with strong work ethic. But through the state corruption now being made accessible to everyone by PASOK, it increasingly eroded the self-reliant community structures of Greece. But yeah, I mean, you can see this even with the Greek diaspora in many Western countries. Since the U.S. and the U.K. are very successful and more entrepreneurial and have higher incomes than the median population. Whereas in Greece, again, a system of institutionalized corruption is kind of eroded at the work ethic. The thing he forgot to mention is the artificially low retirement ages where many of these government workers who also had ghost jobs were able to retire at 55 with a full pension of their last year of their job. And given how long lifespans have extended, a lot of Mediterranean countries have very long lifespans. That could easily be another 20 to 30 plus years of being a paid a full salary while basically sitting at the beach. Let's stop for a moment just to explain what a ghost job is. Basically, you made a deal with a politician who consequently owed you a favor and that politician registered you or one of your relatives as an employee of a public sector job. Again, Tammany Hall and the countrywide scale. Overall, the excess employment by the government 
and both sides willing to offer their coalitions patronage without having anybody pay the cost of it is what ended up with disaster and what it really seems to amaze me here is how basically without saying so directly both major parties in Greece did the ostrich move and put their head under the sand while their finances sunk underwater in fact during the time when they were trying to raise debt to finance this uh, they even recruited Goldman Sachs to help them um, arrange their books to make them less dire than they actually were at the time. Here to collect taxes, the clientistic business structure interwoven with the state, the overly bloated public sector and the enormous costs to the state combined to shape a recipe for a perfect and unavoidable disaster. A disaster that everyone in the Greek political establishment could see coming. But instead of instituting reforms to mitigate the damage, Greek governments decided to cover up the state of their finances until a foreign crisis blew the lid off. It is almost eerie how both the political right and left knew that an unavoidable disaster was coming, but neither did anything to stop it, neither tried to call out the other for it, but they also didn't have some sort of secret agreement to pretend it wasn't happening. They, curiously, both just seemed to have silently agreed to lie to themselves, each other, and the wider country. In many ways, both parties on the Greek political spectrum agreed to ride a dead gravy train into the abyss. The amount of money the rest of Europe spent after 2008 to bail out the indebted Greek state lies at a quarter of a trillion euros. Yeah, so you go straight into the bailouts here. But again, this video has been great in explaining all the historical context on what was the tinder that set the fire, but doesn't really explain how Greece was able to rack up that debt. Like, if they were a country that is fiscally responsible and had a culture of that going back for decades, wouldn't the rest of Europe and or banks in Europe and investors just reject taking on Greek debt? No, they didn't. And in the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about the main part where Kraut is missing in this video, which is the financial backing of how Greece was able to get in this debt as much as they did, why it mattered so much to the rest of the world, and what was really the true economic damage and aftermath for Greece when this was all said and done. So Kraut did a good job explaining the historical context to why Greece developed a culture of fiscal profligacy and a low trust society. And those are important parts of the story. However, it doesn't explain why Greece was able to rack up such a crazy high amount of debt in the first place. Like at its peak, Greek debt was over 160% of debt to GDP. And Greece's GDP was artificially inflated by excess government spending. And we'll get to what degree that was the case later in this video. I know this is going long, but it's a very complicated scenario. And so I have to kind of go through step by step to explain this in a way that I feel is sufficient. So, well, the first thing though that really helped Greece raise that all that debt in a normally a capital market that would not trust Greece or make them pay a higher interest rate and therefore limit the amount of money they could effectively raise was its inclusion in the Eurozone. In 2002, Greece was added to the Eurozone. The Euro became an official currency for what was then the Eurozone in 1999, and Greece was added more for political reasons than economic reasons because Greece did not have the type of diversified economy nor the fiscal track record of keeping deficits low to be part of the Eurozone on its own merit. But the European Union and the Euro were not created just for economic reasons, but they were also created for the political reason that if we integrate the, the economies enough to the point that they're using the same currency, they're less likely to go to war with each other and they didn't 
the colony didn't want a repeat of the, the first two world wars. So, therefore, Greece was added. And what it did is it heavily suppressed Greek interest rates. Uh, before the euro became a currency and it was known that Greece was going to be included, interest rates in Greece were 8%. Um, even then, when they officially were admitted into the Eurozone in 2002, they were, f they were over 5%. However, like during the peak of Greek lending, during the Greek debt crisis in 05 and 06, uh, they got below 3% in a world where inflation was 3%. The Brazilian 10-year um, yield was yielding double digits and many other emerging market countries had double digit 10-year yields and the, even the US 10-year yield was above 5 yet you had the 10-year yield in Greece at under 3% this was solely due to the fact that it was in the same currency market in Union as very fiscally disciplined countries such as Germany, the Netherlands, and Finland, but primarily ger Germany. And so they will say, oh, if things something really bad happen, Germany would have to bail them out because if they don't, then the whole Eurozone will go down and Germany needs the Euro to propel its own economic growth and its own export markets is even to this day exports are over 50% of GDP in Germany. Uh, these people were right in the sense that Germany eventually bailed them out, but they were wrong about how much pain economically Germany is willing to put Greece through to do that. And as you see, when the Greek credit crisis really started rolling in 2009 and the, the credit downgrades came, uh, Greek debt yields exploded from 5% to well over 35% at the peak of the crisis and the peak of the political part of the crisis when um, Syriza was first elected in 2015 they got back over 15% despite uh, trillions of euros in ECB QE going on which was supposed to suppress rates across the eurozone in fact that's why Greek yields are as low as they are today is mainly because the ECB has backstopped all of the profligate countries so people don't really concern themselves with it it's actually kind of crazy um, until recently there's one point in 2020s well, in 2021 where Greek 10-year yields were at the same level as treasuries uh, so that's how they were able to raise the money because they got artificially low interest rates from being strapped onto the eurozone and therefore getting their credit rating boosted artificially the Greek economy is never that efficient a lot of people say, oh, the Greek economy was great back then, wasn't it? And that's how they were able to raise their money. No. I mean, this is Greek unemployment. Even during the boom years, like 2000 to 2008, uh, Greek unemployment was above 10% really until 2005. And it never got below 5%. It got a lot worse during the crisis where you saw Greek unemployment over 25% for over a year. And even now... Um, almost 10 years after the peak of the crisis, it's still in double digits. It's because Greece's economy is structurally inefficient for many of the reasons that Kraut mentioned, among others. Uh, when it comes to um, the, the, the dire consequences of what this means for Greece now, uh, it's disastrous. Greece will go down as only the second country in the history of the modern world to lose its first world status. And what I mean by um, a country of achieving first world status is really countries that have exceeded 25,000 US dollars or $30,000 per year in GDP per capita and then fell back below 20 and stayed down there. Uh, in today's dollars, of course. Uh, Greece had a miraculous run in GB per capita, mainly financed by excess borrowing and government spending to prop up and overpay a lot of people who otherwise were not productive. It spiked uh, from when its inclusion in the Eurozone in 2002 to slightly under $15,000 per capita 
to $32,000 per capita at its peak, uh, which put it nearly at the same level as Spain back then and Italy today and well above Portugal and put it into from being an emerging market, second world type country similar to a lot of the post um, the pre-Warsaw Pact countries such as Poland and Hungary and Czech Republic are today to a first world country within a decade. And then since the Greek debt crisis, all that progress has basically been evaporated. Uh, Greek GDP per capita is now at $18,000 a year. That's a 40% decline from its peak, which is historically very rare. The only really comparison is what happened to Argentina after their hyperinflationary episodes. Argentina is the only other country in the history of the modern world to lose first world status. And so Greece has fallen down to being a emerging market country, which it hurts social prestige for Greece, but it also hurts in the fact that a different type of investor profile will invest in emerging markets and they will often demand a higher return, which means um, lower valuations for Greek assets in the future. Let's now compare Greece to other like developed recent newly developed countries that were quote unquote emerging markets uh during the early 2000s when greece was on its rise um israel and south korea i uh, they started at a similar place to greece was in terms of GDP per capita in fact really greece and south korea were identical in 2000 and greece surpassed israel in gdp per capita between 2003 and 2010 but while Greece completely unwound and fell into its crisis Israel and South Korea have continued to ascend and entrench their status as first world developed countries to this day uh, it doesn't it shows you that again with the strength of the performance of the Greek diaspora overseas it's not about anything fundamentally wrong with the Greek people, but it's the institutions that Kraut mentioned that were developed in a way to make Greece economically inefficient and socially unable to produce the type of economy that would produce genuine first world living standards. So that concludes my thoughts on Kraut's video and my analysis on the debt crisis. He's done a great job with the historical perspective and how the cultural biases and the mismanagement of the state led to um, the fiscal prophecy and unsustainability of Greeks' economy. Whereas I've added to really was the part of how Greece was able to raise the capital in the first place and trigger the crisis. The reason why they triggered the crisis, if I didn't make clear, is they raised way more debt beyond the realistically possible their economy to pay. And once that was exposed in 2008, uh, Greece basically had to pay back that debt through austerity um, and reduced living standards to become more competitive. So all their gains really in supposedly living standards and GDP per capita in the 2000s that were created by debt were shortly wiped away and sent Greece back to emerging market status. I'd like to know your feedback. Please write your comments in the channel if you have any questions, or you can email us at askafundmanager at gmail.com. Please also um, like and subscribe. Uh, we really would like to continue this discussion of what your guys' thoughts are on the Greek debt crisis, and if there's any other videos you think I should do reactions to. Good luck out there on the markets and thanks for watching this.